there was a period starting in the mid 80s where dance and club music gets like money put behind it. These bands start getting signed and Mute starts having a bunch of money. And so it becomes a totally different thing starting at about, you know, let's say 86, 87. I mean, Nitzareb really kind of is like one of the big breakouts in terms of, especially in Europe and England, not necessarily right out of the gate in the United States, but certainly by the time of belief, um, it's going beyond, you know, the cocoon of wax tracks and, and maybe, you know, later Cleopatra and whatever. Um, you know, goth, dark, industrial, um, basically, you know, theatrical, um, aggressive, industrial sort of pop is this whole genre um, from the in, the in the late 80s and the pre-Nirvana times. And there's a lot of value here because these records really are good, a lot of them. You know, the, the easiest one out the gate is Ministry because they were on an absolutely enormous, you know, deal and they were huge in selling tons of records and they were just the right amount of like maybe a little shocking, um, you know, to be cool for kids, um, you know, especially with the videos and the L.A. riots for New World Order and all that, um, you know, from the time, I mean, yeah, they had they had Anglophile, you know, sort of mid-tempo electro crap in the mid-80s. Every Day is Halloween was an enormous hit. And then Jorgensen, like, starts really doing drugs and wants to do something super hardcore. And it's kind of in the air. It's in the ether with a lot of these people. You know, Revco and a lot of other people are coming around. If you haven't read Al Jorgensen's book, I've recommended it in other places. It's probably the most singular document of what was really going on um, and certainly his part in what was going on in that transition into like, okay, we can actually make really crazy music with this. And listen, the Jesus Lizard are part of this on their first EP. Um, you know, the original Bloody Mary and stuff, they, they're using drum machines. They were almost, they almost decided to be an industrial band because it really, the limitation of the drum machines and of the sound um, is like, you know, exactly, it's its own thing. Um, you know, and a lot of this too, you, you'll see like right on this page, it's up, here you see EBM, electronic body music. And that's a really, really specific, you know, genre concept, mostly coming out of DAF in Germany. And, you know, there were, there were English bands that were emulating it too. Famously, there's a seven inch that a bunch of us um, on the Discord had, have traded around, actually before Discord even existed. Um, uh, there are some of the people that are still around and talking amongst ourselves. There was an English band that John Peel loved called Tools You Can Trust. And that was a band that had like a super obscure single that they were trying to like do EBM, not like Gang of Four or Angular post-punk, but EBM has like a beat to it. And it's, it's super inspired by like Joy Division's Heart and Soul uh, and the more up-tempo Joy Division stuff. They took it and made it, you know, a more, you know, Teutonic, whatever. Um, they made it a more, you know, loop-based rep repetitive thing while still being aggressive and having that jump, you know, uh, hyper beat. So yeah, Blockbuster was another one, like such a great tune. Um, tune. But anyway, um, so there's a, there's a really good nut of bands that whether it's because they've been reissued later, et cetera, between like classic big time industrial pop um, in the mid and late 80s and getting into even Big Beat, which is something I absolutely loved. And, and you know, a number of us here in the, the chat loved, um, you know, Big Beat really that one of the signature bands there is Meet Beat Manifesto and, and coming out of Satyricon in the early 90s with them. Um, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of nuance to it because you have acts like, you know, um, Lords of Acid that essentially make goth glam and whether that can be called industrial or it's just like, oh, this is sexual electronic music. It's so like slutty and we don't care. Um, you know, there's flavors to all of this and, and goth is peppered around it and EBM is peppered around it and pure down the line, you know, like stomp, stomp, whack, Nitzareb, like, you know, with, I mean, look at the freaking cover of that total age. I mean, this is like similarly to image wise, not necessarily music Depeche Mode. Um, this is like going for the, the Soviet, you know, propaganda artwork and the militaristic, you know, chants and all that crap. Join in the chant. I mean, this is Nitzrev's breakthrough 12 inch, um, which appears on that total age. 
but that run, these three records are absolutely astonishingly good. That Total Age Belief uh, is actually somewhat underrated, and Showtime is the crest. I mean, this was one of the most formative records of my childhood. I was like 14, 15 when I heard it. I'd never heard anything like it. Um, you know, Simon is just like, he was such a, he was just like such a good looking dude. He had the cool bangs and shit. Um, you know, Lightning Man was, was one of the first, I think about like, the Cure's Lullaby and and Nitzreb's Lightning Man, these totally crazy, like, such a cool set of influences. It's got, like, almost like a New Orleans swing. It's got a baritone. Uh, I don't know if it's a clarinet or an oboe or whatever in it. And, I mean, because it's... These are people who spent their lives trying to make music that could swing with drum machines that couldn't do swing. There's no Fruity Loops in 1990. Like, the drum machines barely had any. Like, of course, the 808 famously has a swing fader. But, you know, to really do it and have it snap and be better than music that's sort of pinned in by the limitations of the technology was not easy to do. It was easier by 1990, but it wasn't that easy. And it's something I've repeatedly said that we sort of celebrate the Cocteau Twins for, is that Robin Guthrie was making music with really shitty, harsh drum machines and, and making it palatable, not making it... Like, the drum machine didn't rule the music out, where the drum machine had ruled out you know a lot of independent bands who couldn't make sophisticated music with it a la new order a la you know our favorite um you know the, the mid 80s is a wash with stock aikman waterman you know acts that are rinse and repeat that same mid-tempo funk um you know 16th beat swing and the and the orc hits and then you got you know jimmy jam and terry lewis you got the oberheim and and just all this technology going in these different directions the point is that bands that didn't have access to enormous studio resources and money and weren't producers let's say working with famous artists who again had blank checks for them to accomplish that i think it's really appreciable and a lot of it was happening in industrial um so that's, yeah, I wanted, I wanted to go through and see what kind of, you know, what kind of a bag you could get. I mean, you can see here, I've rebought a bunch of this. The Showtime I bought because, so Showtime was, it, it's infamous for having this fluorescent orange cover, but it's also infamous for that cover fading from sunlight. And so, like, you literally, it looks like it's almost black and white if you have an old copy of this. I got this because I bought a 2006 2LP reissue because it's just such an iconic piece of artwork for me and some Gen Xer my age. Um, there was a 2LP reissue. I think it's even orange vinyl. I could give a crap. I just wanted to have a big, physical, nice quality reprint of that cover. Um, but it is decidedly CD gang material. All of this is CD gang material. It was all digital. Um, and, you know, the idea of... Vinyl, of, of uh, a vinyl of it is just is eminently silly. Um, you have a cigarette burn on the jewel case of your copy, John. That's sweet. That's period. That's some period correctness. We talk about that all the time. Those little flourishes, those little touchers. But yeah, I mean, this is 100% a CD medium. Um, and the, so that's interesting, Jock. You're mentioning that, you know, this is similar to what I said about how in, a, in the old video I did in 2013 about goth. Um, it was one of the four or five videos I did that really got around and got some traction. Goth is so many different things. It's Cold Wave and then it's Cleopatra Records and Robert Smith hair and pancake makeup. And then it becomes mainstream with Nine Inch Nails and Marilyn Manson and all of that shit. And Rob Zombie too, who, you know, I still, I mean, everybody loves Dragula. He's a, he's solidly locked as a, as a positive celebrated meme for a few of those tunes. Um, but yeah, the industrial similarly is part of that whole thing. And what is and isn't industrial, you know, similar to Nisreb, you know, on Discogs being branded an EBM band. I would, you know, they're absolutely a cornerstone, watershed industrial band right at the top. I mean, this is like when Livok and, and other bands are forming. Um, and some others I've pulled tabs. There's a bunch of tabs I've got out. One of the things I want to get out of the way, though, if you want to collect this genre, you do have to stick to the mainstream stuff. Because... A lot of this experimental industrial coming out of the, the lineage of Throbbing Gristle, right? Um, a lot of that is like crass, hardcore, I mean the band crass. It's, it's really tied to DIY. And especially if your whole gambit is like being really extreme and terrifying and having like, you know, politically incorrect offensive artwork, you're not going to end up on fucking mute. So when you talk about the current 93s, Nurse with Wound, 
they're all re it's all self-released it's this cottage industry of the self and it's a total 100 percent intentional cult of you know not only personality but of the artist i'm not really a fan of that i never have been like i can't like fuck the white house all that shit it's just never been for me um i think it's i think it's just embarrassingly trite um and convinced of its own you know um it's just convinced of its own gravity, but I find it really laughable and, and pathetic. And, uh, that's me, but you know, some of it, you know, current 93 got bigger and I am a fan. I mean, like thunder perfect mind is one of the ones a lot of people go to and say that like, that's major, you know? Um, and, and there was one right around that time. The pretty, all the pretty horses is another one like nineties current threat. 93 was doing relatively oh well well up through special plan for this world in 2000 what i have you know what i have collected um and and sort of do still enjoy is the season eps um and that's just something i wanted to mention because i'm not going to spend a lot of time on um on these artists these kind of ultra artists but um I'm on the wrong thing. What am I on? Bah, 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 bah. What, what am I, whose page am I on? Oh, current 93. I thought I was on coil. Um, so <laughs> that, so, but coil is another one similarly where eschaton is its own thing, but these EPs, the, the Equinox seasonal EPs, I just wanted to mention in 98, these are really interesting. Like some of it is harsh and grading, but there's some really beautiful stuff too. Um, none of it's going to be cheap. You're going to be paying 10 plus bucks for these, you know, coil, the horse rotavator famously in 86 is like, you know, every you know in five records to get you into industrial is going to have horse rotivator um and and probably you know a couple others but the ones i don't see mentioned that much for coil anyway um again this is all self-released on eschaton uh is those season eps so if you were into them and maybe you you hadn't focused on this run um, that's one i'd recommend there but nurse you know in current um that whole united diaries door you know uh thing the dirtro thing you're never going to find any of this as value so, and and it's not something i'm really i've spent time on I, I just don't i don't go in for this stuff but they're obviously significantly important a significantly important wing of industrial that as i say is descended from throbbing gristle but i wanted to get out of the way at the top that's not where i'm going to go with this and and you know the point of talking about the value of used cds you're not going to get it with the the really like extreme you know fucking whatever you know edgelord bullshit like that um and i was never interested in it anyway if you are you're gonna lose money and it's gonna cost money and you can feel like you know you get it and uh you can handle it or something i don't fucking know whatever um cab Volta, so cabaret voltaire is uh you know one of the most legendary things um coming out of that period they're right at the start with throbbing gristle but they're in sheffield and you know, fortunately, a lot of their stuff has been reissued and also they have changed styles really significantly. Now, one of the signature things is when they start working with Rough Trade and they get Red Mecca. Um, this is an absolute classic and you can get this, you know, a reissue or whatever um, for not much. And this is the other thing with Industrial. Who gives a shit about a reissue? What are they going to do? They're, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to be pure the original it's fucking harsh industrial noise and most of it's electronic so the signal response and the whole like loudness wars thing is sort of irrelevant so for me even here in the states i mean you know, i doubt we're going to find anything cheap on red mecca over here but certainly in europe and the uk you will be able to find it um for not much um yeah 10 12 bucks you know here used um yeah i mean you know that's that's decent um but i mean this might still be in print so is it even worth it at that point versus buying new um but you know when you get later into like the the um you know what they sort of called like the white funk period uh for cabaret in the mid 80s there's some really great singles in there uh the drain train um you know look a lot of people hated when they tried to get you know more song based and and commercial but they really didn't have any choice and this period leading into the conversation um this is a really really good sweet spot um and and a record that if you want to figure out if you like them um you know you can really these are records you can hopefully find for not all that much you're not going to find any vinyl uh, because again that's just pure fetish property but on cd it doesn't look like in the us you're going to be making anywhere with this unfortunately um you know 10 bucks <laughs> it doesn't even have the second disc so yeah this unfortunately this isn't a good example i mean a lot of these bands are are so legendary and revered that 
you're not going to take advantage of it. Because this wasn't a band that ever had breakthrough hits of the kind that a ministry or a Nitzarev did. Um, so again, this is just more about trying to talk about bands that are significant in the genre and whether or not they fall into this collectible kind of, you know, you can get a bag, cheap CD thing. Certainly, Nitzarev does. They were on mute almost right out of the gate. They took a long time doing 12 inches to come together. Uh, yeah, no, and exactly. You know, the, the, the groundswell, the, the, the vast majority, rather, of the bands that followed in that Throbbing Gristle Wake, the Coils and, and, and Nurse With Wounds and stuff, this is heavily this, this British, English, um, you know, uh, thing. Um, and, and so, yeah, in the States, you're, you're kind of caught out if they weren't, if they weren't, you know, if they didn't do a deal over here the way that, um, a lot of these other bands did. I mean, you know, and a lot of people thought that Sareb were, you know, were, were Belgian similar to, um, and you know, another band I'll get to in, in a bit on this, but if you go through here, right. Um, you know, again, this is, this is just the quick way to do it. You just, you click on the album. There's 173 copies of this for sale. 173. Okay. Well, how many are in the States? 46 copies of this, you know, and it's absolutely landfill. Like you can get it for, I'm, I'm guessing there's gotta be three, four 99 copies of this. Yep. There you go. Um, and this is, you know, you go through, you try and find a store, somebody might have all of them. Um, so, you know, right here, pull up this one, five bucks. Okay. You know, it's not bad if they have other ones and they do, now you're talking, you're getting, you know, all three of their, you know, important landmark, really solid committed albums before they try and kind of get hits with Kick It and Big Hit, which on Ebhead and stuff, I'll get to that. These are the three. This is the, this is the rep that Nitzareb has, is these three albums. And you get them right here for you know, less than basically maybe 20 bucks shipped. If you go through the rest of this store, I'm sure this is an individual seller. You're going to be able to find other stuff that you'd want. Oh, look. Oh yeah. Great. <laughs> yeah. 69 bucks. Of course you got to be kidding me with this shit. I love it. <laughs> well, we'll go over and uh, we'll, we'll hit up house mountain on Twitter and we can talk about what this is going for. Um, Anyway, so, you know, individual sellers, that's where, like, for stuff like this, where you're looking for a genre bag, and maybe you want to stick to, you know, that, smaller individual sellers, it's going to be from a personal collection, they're probably going to be in great shape, um, you know, give it a spin, Am I, I'm not seeing much here in terms of other, well, Smarties, there you go, get some, uh, some vintage cheese tech, um, you know, this looks like somebody's just generally indie rock, and maybe unloading a lot of crap they don't care about anymore, Fly Pan Am, not bad. Yep. Um, you know, you, there's, there's probably some good stuff here, but not what I was expecting. Um, oh my God. Kissing the pink on cassette. If you got the money, the stores, this, the seller's got some interesting stuff. Um, this is really, really early kissing the pink. So not strictly an industrial band mu at all, much more a goth band that started with a, maybe a little bit of a cold wave pinch. Um, you know, certain things are likely it was legit a hit. It was on Mercury. They got signed, um, and and you know, it did okay. It's not the it's not what I go to um, for them. I, I you know the first album I've got like two copies of this. Um, you know, Desert Song uh, is an all timer. Uh, this band was just beautiful synth pop. Um, very much like when you think about Dead Can Dance, and they're you know if Dead Can Dance had been a pop band almost that kind of a thing. But Kissing the Pink's a really interesting one that, that has only been really recycled and talked about recently. I've been championing them super loud. Um, you know, that I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of that, that act. The 5113 comp. This, man, people paid such stupid money for this, and there's nothing. There's one song on it, I think. Um, like, if you, it's the comp of the Donkey Rhubarbs and Venelin EPs. So Pancake Lizard is like uh, Aphex Twins kind of down-tempo song absolutely love it. And I love Donkey Rhubarb as a single. Venelin, like I don't need eight mixes of Venelin, but anyway, for 18 bucks, this was a warp release in Japan only in Australia. It was basically an APAC intro to like catching up with Aphex Twin thing of three singles around the time of I Care Because You Do. Um, and you know, I, Aphex Twin spawns a lot of completists. So there's, that's, that's not a bad price for that, frankly. I mean, it's just come down from where it was during peak warp apex, you know, insanity. Um, but yeah, you know, looking through this, I, I don't know, you, you would try to figure a bag. 
um, maybe. But you know, if you go here, like here's someone who's got it for four bucks and has a ton of stuff in the store, you know, and just see if they have anything else. Bam, they got two out of three. That's not bad. Um, belief for six, that total age for four. Um, you know, see see what the cheap ones, the cheap sell. Oh, this is a very tiny store. Okay, Slipknot, Divine Heresy. Uh, yeah, this is more of what we would have expected. Danzig 5, the promo of Black Acid Devil. Not bad, you know. Lot, you know, unfortunately, it looks like they they think that the promo has value, which for some people it does. Um, a lot of Travis. I'm a, I'm a Travis sucker. I love me some pipe dreams. Decrups. Yep. Man, eh, you, you could probably get a little tackhead. There's another one. Trashed, <laughs> trashed copy of reality. Uh, this is this is definitely legend industrial shit. So this is a obviously a private seller that's got some good uh some good deeper industrial cuts in there mortal rain cassette what the fuck um yeah so i mean this sort of just an awesome starting point to getting really three really solid um like absolutely foundational you know polished industrial pop aggressive industrial rage and pop records i mean this album you should never pay much for and when like when I think about albums that you can absolutely get for a dollar that are are lights out fucking great, this is one of the like top tens that anybody looking to get into this should have. Like it's everywhere. It was overprinted like crazy. Geffen promoted and paid a ton of marketing for this album, and uh, it's it's unbelievably good. Um, yeah, Jewel Case has a crack on the cover. Who cares? A uh, dollar fifty. And, you know, do they have anything else? Probably not. No. I mean, this, yeah, this looks like a total head. Leonard Skinner had Eagle. Yeah, no, that's not going to be a good one. But, like, find a seller, you know, and it, like I said, this is probably going to have sun damage. Um, yeah, here's somebody who has ebb head, too. So maybe they have, like, they're unloading all their nits or ebb. No. So this is after that. This is when they kind of, they didn't sell out, but they sort of, um, they didn't have it together showtime was heavily promoted when you have a big album with a bunch of money behind it um yeah it you you end up not being able to write the next record and that happened here i think in my estimation i give to you is leftover from showtime um it just sounds like it should have been on it and you know the rest of the record is super uneven um you know frankly the one after it was was almost better um which was uh which had the the kind of attempt at a comeback single in uh, in Kick It on Big Hit. Um, it's not a good album, um, but but these t you know you, you call your shot whatever you know these I don't really know that Ebb Head or Big Hit are really um, are really a big deal. This was interesting. The demos for this leaked. This was a cassette that was going around. Um, they were really trying hard to keep people aware of this band and sell them. Uh, and it just didn't really didn't really work too well. There's also, of course, um, the entire you know CD single concept, and this is really interesting because industrial music was all about remixes, you know, similar to straight techno and, and other genres. Um, the the singles, the CD singles for these, you know, if you can find them, uh, definitely worth getting. Like cool value add, you know, I'd pay seven. The singles are harder to find generally than the albums, you know. Um, and, you know, unless it's a band that ends up doing a catch-all kind of, you know, rarities comp or whatever, um, you know, you, you go look through, you know, it looks like Mute did a, a three-inch CD because that was really trendy. Um, did they? Yep, they did. So there's a trendy three-inch of this. I would doubt much of these made it over to the States. Yeah, there's two, and they're probably asking like, yeah, 10 bucks. Um, you know, this stuff is, is really cool. I mean, it's stuff that, you know, I'm not urgently going to be picking up, but you know, at some point, you know, when I'm a little more flush, this is the one I have, and this is the one you want. Um, this is a sampler they did of the three singles from Showtime, and it's got the best mixes of them. The industry versus the ad mix is the, is the, the clincher. Um, the Renegade Soundwave mix is also awesome. And then the trance mix of Getting Closer is great. This thing uh, is a total monster. And this was relatively well circulated. So uh, yeah, there you go. There's probably a ton of copies of this. And I would definitely recommend, yeah, that's sweet right there. $4.99 for that, so worth it. Um, and a small store. Yeah, there you go. They got a bunch. <laughs> it looks like they've got as is, maybe some other. Uh, yeah, there you go. 
Um, they're not they're not going for cheap on all of it, but in terms of the again the value prop of getting it all in one place, this was a big Nitzarev fan that is unloading their whole collection. Holy crap! The Warsaw Ghetto be so bright, so strong, Maxi. Oh shit! This is a massive. Oh, such an important 12 inch. Um, uh, this is a reissue, but um, yeah, holy crap. Man, you could, I mean, it's not cheap, unfortunately. And it shouldn't be. Isn't it funny how your body, uh, great. They've really got all the good stuff. The remixes for Warsaw Ghetto. And this stuff is not that common. And clearly you can tell this is a collector. So they're being extremely straight up about condition. The condition is probably better than what they're marking. Um, man, they're unloading it all. Oh, the shame single. This was not common. Um, man, pretty sick. Uh, yeah, they probably have a lot of other, um, they potentially, well, they don't have a ton of stuff for sale, but they might have ministry too. Nah. Um, but it's a small store, but anyway, um, yeah. So, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the sort of U S foil to that definitely is ministry. Uh, there should be no question. If you want to get into ministry, you can do it for five bucks and get like three albums. <laughs> Um, the, you know, you really want to get this run. I mean, these four, this is what you want. Land, Rape, and Honey, Minds of Trouble Things, especially in case you didn't feel like showing up live. This is such an incredible live album. Uh, and then Psalm 69. I mean, this is this run is unbeatable. It's four, uh, you know, three albums and a live album that are all front to back, you know, you know, flawless. And it's everywhere, and, and you should be able to get the CDs for nothing. Um, Stigmata is one of the signature tracks of, of MTV even launching 120 minutes. That song was so incredibly, you know, crossover. Um, because it was shocking. Like no one had heard anything like it. Um, and Sire put the money behind it and promoted it. And, um, you know, it's not even my favorite song on the record, but it's, it's crucial. And I mean, it just rains three to $5 copies of this. You just try and find, you know, a somewhat big store go in there, search ministry, and just try and get all four of these um, wherever you can in one bag. Uh, the Missing, it, so The Missing does this thing that Al Jorgensen is one of the only people that really explored heavily. It's one of my favorite tricks, and he does it on uh, all three of these records, if I recall. And what he does is he drifts, he tempo drifts. So because the drum machine is the drum machine, and it will never alter, alter its time signature, it's just going like whack, 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 whack on nonstop, right? He'll, he'll drift the guitar riff a beat back. So all of a sudden it's hitting on the kick instead of the snare and he inverts the tempo and he does it at the end of the missing and they even do it right at live with a real drummer. Um, and it's this, it's why it leads off, honestly, this, um, and it's so fucking crazy and cool. Um, he does, I don't think he, he does it toward the end of just one fix too. Yep. So he does it on all three records. And then this here TV two is the first time pretty much any teenager or, or most people would have heard what is now and popularly known as grindcore. Um, this is, you know, insanely fast. It's a, it's like a threshold pushing speed. Like this song is designed to, like I saw them play this live. It's, it's absolutely nuts. And I mean, this was also the peak era, um, of them in terms of the best drummer like ever. So it, it was seeing it at Lollapalooza TV two was just absolutely crazy. Um, Metallica do do that. All. Yes. Uh, Gabriel, that's absolutely true. Uh, Metallica is also a fan of this move and it's something that is more common in thrash and heavy metal. Um, whether it, like if somebody does it by mistake and they're like, that was cool, let's actually do it. Um, Al did it all through this period. And, um, yeah, I mean, you know, look, if, if, if you're not familiar with these records, they're absolute landmarks, like forget industrial. Th this is like just incredible hard rock. It's not going to turn you off and be like, I'm, you know, killing a cat in my shed. It's not like trying to be really scary or, or threatening in that way. It's like fucked up, aggressive, raging rock music in the tradition of black Sabbath with this, you know, one of the best producers in Al Jorgensen of electronic, you know, club and dance music, taking it into this insane bullet train level. And I mean, Thieves, Burning Inside is, is my favorite ministry song of all time. Um, the, these records, so what? Like, this is a live staple, you know, similar to, like, 
you know, a band like The Cure has a song like Faith and they play it for 20 minutes. They'll play So What for like 15 minutes live. It's fucking ridiculous. Dream Song is legendary, like this complete, you know, acid fucked up thing. Um, and he's just, it was his best band. I mean, Bill Rayflin is just, the, it was one of the best drummers of all time. He was just, I, I mean, seeing this guy live was like, oh my God, I have a whole other world of shit to learn about playing drums. Because I'd grown up playing along to The Cure and to Mid-Tempo Echo and the Bunnyman record. And look, Pete Freeze and this, Boris Williams, those were fantastic rock drummers. This guy, holy shit, was he something else, man. And and like carrying ministry live every night on Lollapalooza. I mean, see, Thieves, even Thieves, which is not like tempo versus TV2, like, you know, brutal tempo exercise. He just, that guy was... Uh, it's so missed and, and such an incredible player. Um, anyway, you know, ministry then goes on and just, you know, Al Jorgensen stubbornly puts out an album every five minutes and goes in and out of political bullshit. And, you know, look, the later stuff, I don't really give a shit about it. I will say the, um, this wasn't too bad. He tried to do a, a kind of vintage nineties live record, live Necronomicon on Cleopatra. It's not bad. Um, unfortunately it doesn't look like anyone's selling it for, very little, um, but it's pretty good, you know, as like a late period, you know, reclamation live record. You saw him at SPAC, Cole, the Saratoga Performing Arts Center. I know it well. Um, yeah, I so there was a riot. I've talked about it. I did a video about Lollapalooza in 2012 when I was doing uh, YouTube videos, and the the Massachusetts National Guard was called out to the show. It's no bullshit. Like 100, 100 riot gear cops showed up and encircled the arena. People ripped down the fence and lit 40-foot bonfires in three different places of the lawn at Great Woods in, um, in Massachusetts. And it, the, it was so insane and fucked up that they wouldn't let Lollapalooza back. And so the Primus, the third or whatever Primus Lollapalooza went to an airport in Rhode Island um, and that was the last one I went to. I only went to the first three, but the ministry one was the peak of ministry. Like at that level of stage production, ministry should play in front of 50,000 people. Like if you hear them do super not the, the Sabbath tune they did with as a thousand homo DJs, cause like revolting cocks and, and pig face and all this, this is all related Chicago, -y, uh, industrial people. And, um, they had this, one of their side projecty things. You know, there's beer steers and queers. Um, there's, you know, Jesus built my hot rod. Um, and, and, and like I said, a thousand homo DJs and super not this cover of black Sabbath was just, when I heard that I was like, I had to go find that CD immediately. Cause some, like some gothier kid I knew had it. And I was just like, fuck. And that, that, you know, that Al Jordan's voice, it's artificial and everything, but like, you got like, there's a famous anecdote. Fred Dirtz from fucking Limp Biscuit wanted him to produce a Limp Biscuit record because he wanted his vocal sound. Because Fred Dirtz can't sing for shit. He can't sing. He's not even good talking. Like his voice is so awful and uninteresting. He sounds like a fucking guy at a pickup basketball game. Um, and he asked Al Jorgensen to like. He, he, Jorgensen tells this story in his book. He asked Al Jorgensen to put like the same vocal p effects and patches on his voice so he could sound like Al Jorgensen and be like intimidating and hard. And it's like, no, dude, it's his voice is the reason. It's not the square wave fuzz distortion on the signal. Um, so it's a really funny story. And, you know, you may be able to you may be able to Google it without having to buy his book, but you should buy his book because, I mean, this guy, I believe 50 percent of the insanity in his life is documented in his memoir. There's probably 50% more illegal and fucking stupid, outrageously awful, self-absorbed, narcissistic, nihilistic bullshit this guy did when he was up his ass so far that he rolled three Supras and, you know, was like basically trying to start a fucking cult in Texas on a ranch. Like, this guy was so fucking far gone. He was drinking like a bottle of Johnny Blue with acid in the bottom, a bottle of the bottom for like days on end. I mean, he's been to rehab, I don't know how many times... It's crazy. I, it's just nuts. And I mean, look, I don't, I don't celebrate it, but I'm a fan of like, you know, rock and roll death cult bullshit to an extent. I'm not going to lie about it. Um, and it was definitely part, you know, similar to the cures modelinism or joy divisions bullshit, you know, reputation that you, you understand better as you get older and you develop a more kind of 360 degree nuanced view of like, that's not a great way to live. You know what I mean? But like when you're a kid, it seems so there's a line in that fucking hilarious, um, 
piece of shit Bradley Cooper movie where he's like basically trying to be Anthony Bourdain. And there's this other British actor who's like, he says something to the effect of like, you know, uh, youthful nihilism is, is appealing when you're, you know, 38, it's really not. And it's true. And, but, but everyone who's been infected by that impulse struggles with it. And some people never get over it and they die. Throb died from Primal Scream. You know, like some people just never get out of it, whether it's a bottle or it's a powder or it's a pill. Um, yeah, Limp Bizkit did famously cover Thieves, which is hilariously double stupid because Primus covered it and did an actually fucking amazing cover that is legendary because Les Claypool plays the 16th beat bass drum on his bass. And it, I saw him do it and I, got, I actually got knocked unconscious because I didn't understand. To me, Primus was like a dork band. I didn't re like they were like a muso dork band. Like they weren't cool at all. I didn't understand that like the Beavis and Butthead generation was like wanting to fucking mosh to Primus. When I went to, I, without any thought, I ran right up into the middle of the front of the floor, well, it was grass, to get close to the stage to check out Primus because I had loved them for years. Um, you know, as a drummer, they were, obviously Herb was really inspiring to me and, and taught me a lot. He, I learned triplets from Primus, kick triplets, and I do them wrong. I do heel, uh, heel toe for doubles and heel, um, heel toe, uh, heel for triplets. You're supposed to do, um, pad push pad push anyway um yeah i got knocked out they opened with thieves and i was like holy shit this is so cool and i was just like moshing with you know some other guys and actually there were some gals too and then all of a sudden when it comes in this someone like they i don't think they did a stage dive or somebody threw them wherever but they went uh ass over tea kettle and their doc martin hit me in right in the back of the crown of the head i actually got knocked out and someone dragged me out of the pit um, and I woke up, I had a concussion. I woke up, I threw up and, um, the older kid who had driven us there, uh, took me to the hospital, um, in Providence, man. Yeah. I, I told that story more briefly in that old video 10 years ago, but so, you know, ministry and it's red, that's just a total win. Uh, another interesting one, uh, is Alan Wilder. Now this is not strictly indu industrial. This is sort of getting into electronic music, but, um, in in 80 uh sorry 89 into 91 he had this project going called recoil this is like him okay i'm not going to quit uh i'm not going to quit depeche mode this guy so if you don't know alan wilder is like some people would argue he's responsible for all of depeche mode's best material that's your argument to have but um you know he martin atkins was involved in this and uh he had uh he samples buka white so this is sort of famous for electro blues for Buka White sampling an old scratchy um, record, like a Delta blues record, the exact way that Moby did. And Moby is uh, sort of ancillary to this record. So it's very clear that um, Moby, basically Moby stole this idea and did better with it. Like, honestly, this is a eight minute dirge. It's, it, I, I can't make it all the way through it, but, um, Tony Halliday wrote and from curve wrote and sings, well, co-wrote and sings two songs on this. I think it's bloodline and freeze. Um, and it leads off with a cover of Alex, the Alex Harvey band's faith healer, which is not a very good cover. Um, it's one of my favorite songs, the original Alex Harvey version and was an absolutely enormous influence on, uh, on Robert Smith and the cure, but the singer from Nitzer Ebb sings it. Um, and so it's a collab with all these other people in the early nineties, late eighties that are in this, you know, pre grunge, um, you know, refined electronic industrial pop situation. Um, but yeah, the faith healer cover is, is not great. Uh, I give him credit for trying the important things on this record are the Tony holiday cuts, uh, and electro blues. And this again, a dollar easy, um, the recoil project, you know, it started in that pretentious kind of like wire way, you know, oh, I'm doing two 20 minute movements, uh, dude. But I mean, again, um, it, they got repackaged immediately by mute, um, because Depeche Mode got so big that they were putting out, you know, Martin L. Gore's solo albums and anything Depeche Mode because they were just selling fucking truckloads of records around the time of music for the masses and especially 101. 
Um, but Bloodline is like, this forestalled him quitting Depeche Mode by four years, by them letting him spend time on this and actually release singles and have his own promo cycle. Um, you know, Steve Lyon did it, you know, legendary. This guy is, you know, he's got credits on everything. He's like Flood almost. Um, but, you know, for a flyer, for a buck, if you see it, Bloodline, you know, I would say check out. Um, you know, bigger name classically industrial bands, yeah, Skinny Puppy, you know. Um, the, you can get this stuff all day. Network is an enormous label. These have been in print, repressed, reissued forever. And Two Dark Park is obviously the one. This came out when I was a teenager. Fucking, ev- this is how everybody heard about Skinny Puppy. But again, you know, look, they're starting at six bucks. Um, industrial music, you know, Network isn't Geffen. Like in the Nitzer Ebb situation, you have Geffen pressing 250,000 copies of an album that is never going to sell 20. Um, Skinny Puppy's records, they're going to be, you know, not necessarily... The network ones are your best bet, for sure, in terms of value. The problem is Skinny Puppy is super uneven and weird uh, in terms of which records people favor, which ones are like the one. I mean, you know, Rabies, Last Rites, they, they all have their fans. Again, you're not going below five bucks. I mean, look it's a band with an enormous cult following it's a band that you know industrial music generally does have similar to goth attacks on it um oh you bites in remission yeah i mean you know because it's you know it's sort of or you know the the beginning a lot of people like cab voltaire same argument they're on the first record's the only way and after that they became too commercial yeah i mean i know you're not saying that Refills, but like <laughs> bites, you know, has been these two, these have all been reissued forever. But again, look, right, like on Discogs anyway. But look, if you see this, like, go see if it's in print. Like, it might be. Like, I've made this mistake. I actually did this to somebody on the Discord. <laughs> I felt so bad. I was like, holy crap, this this box set, it's totally out of print. And then someone else in the Discord was like, actually, that's still in print. You get it for fifteen bucks. And I was like, oh fuck. So I actually PayPal'd the money. I felt so bad. They spent like forty five bucks on this box set that I thought was out of print. Totally wasn't. You could get it for nothing, shrink wrapped. Um, so I actually sent the money to Offset, having spent money on my recommendation. Um, so you know, get in the cord. And if I lead you wrong, I'll make it good. Um, so again, yeah, look, twelve fifty. You know, like skinny puppy tax, man. Like cool alt dark music tax. It's it's a thing. It's kind of sucks. Um, but again, I'm not the authority in any sense on Skinny Puppy. This is not my shit, principally. This was too... Uh, well, there you go. You can certainly get rabies for nothing. Um, and it may be a vein. Like, you know, because it was... Okay, so Capital did this. There you go. So this is pressed in excess because it's on Capital. Um, licensed, surely, through Network. So you got to look for stuff that's that's in that position. But is also good because, again, Skinny Puppy becomes different things and goes down a lot of rabbit holes. Um I will pay that tax for rabies. Um, yeah, and then, so, yeah, I didn't pull this up because, again, similarly, a band that goes all over the place is Killing Joke because Killing Joke starts as an angular post-punk band uh, in, in this phenomenal run uh, in the early 80s. And, I mean, up through Fire Dances and Nighttime is where they become, like, we need to start selling some fucking records, guys. So, I mean, this is, like, when the cult comes out, you know, transitions out of Southern Death Cult. Um, the mid-80s, you know... Killing Joke becomes essentially like a a, a goth flavored you know mid tempo band and famously you know 80s was a big influence. Everybody says Cobain ripped it off, um, and and that's fine you know. Um, and Kings and Queens though is the is the one for me. I mean this Kings and Queens still has the lineage of what's this for, which to me is their best album. Um, you know attention, follow the leaders. This record is unbelievable. Um, you know, I love it. And the, some of the songs are a bit drudgy and long, but Exit 2, like, this thing absolutely crushes. And, I mean, the debut does as well. Um, Revelations is a, a contended album. I think it, it's very stereotypically their difficult third album. There's not much I go to on this. I was never a big fan. But then they are like, because of that, you know, they get a deal with EG, and they reconstitute themselves, and they do Fire Dances. Now, Fire Dances is like the most classical gray Anglican, um, you know, like cult rushing, like flange guitar shit. There's four or five, well, three really strong songs. Um, it, it's a fun listen. It's a good listen. Um, but you know, the image is a lot more goth than the music, I would say. Uh, certainly <laughs> jazz is like, um, you know, the, the ultimate goth front man. I mean, dude came out of the gate with black eyeliner and pancake and like, you know, loved having the eyeliner melt down his face and all that shit. 
Um, they're, I mean, they're just a, a majorly legendary band. Now, when you talk about them with respect to industrial, yeah. So they started to make this pivot, this pivot, and unfortunately, like, uh, record labels kind of failed. You know, wrote them off, and could have capitalized because this album did pretty well. It's a good album. I love the song Jaina. I've always loved it. There's two other really good cuts on this. The uh, the lead one is it's really long, but it's good. Communion is good, if I remember correctly. Um, the doc about them is almost unwatchable. I I mean, if they're involved in it, it's gonna be forget it. I mean, I could not imagine trying to do a documentary where you're doing justice to youth and jazz. Like they're it, they will just take over everything. It's it would be like trying to do a documentary about the Cure. You know what I mean? Like it, it, they are so in control of their own mythos, and they're they're frankly really sort of paranoid and weird about it. Um, and fine, they can do whatever they want. I mean, they've diluted their brand pretty roughly during the Cleopatra style 90s era. Um, but this thing is a real standout. It's a very good, incredibly heavy. Like, this is a cinder block production-wise. The bass on this thing is so good, the low end. And it's got really good sludgy, you know, wall of sound guitars. I, I can't recommend it enough. And, I mean, you can get this for nothing. Um, and I mean, even if it was just for Jaina and Pandemonium, give me a break, you know, what a take for a buck to have it on physical, digital, lossless. You know, I'd, I, I'd look for that, check for that every time out. The early stuff, um, you know, the, the early stuff you can probably get cheap because of reissues, but their reissues are really dodgy. Um, so, you know, CD ultimately, like I said, and I've said repeatedly, early mid eighties, classic alt rock bands like this that were done all analog the initial cds are either really soft and are going to give you a lot of hiss and and problems with the headroom or the remasters are going to be so friggin blown out that they're going to sound really chubby and kind of ugly um the, so it doesn't look like in the states anyway you're making out on this and these are reissued the virgin reissues going for that much this is no jewel case cd this is i love this so if listen if like I said, if you get yourself some slug blank CD cases, oh yeah, the first Killing Joke, just for the image, the iconic, the iconic album cover, I have that on vinyl for that reason. Totally agree, Free Real Fools. That's one where there are certain things where I want the full-size 12-inch. Like, I just wanted to look at it. I don't care about vinyl, but as an object, there are certain records I iconically want to have on vinyl, and the first Killing Joke is totally one of them. This one is not, because the album cover is so ugly and who gives a shit. But the first album cover of Killing Joke is just, I mean, it's like any signature piece of, of rock and roll. It's like the Sex Pistols, never mind the Bullocks in a lower tier. Um, most people prefer the debut. No, no, definitely, Jock, that's not uncommon. Um, for me, it's that when they get into the dun 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 like all that shit, I'm fucking such a sucker for that shit. Like the hip shake drum tom thing on this record, and they beat it into the fucking ground. But this is the original EG CD you're getting. It just doesn't have the plastic jewel case for nine bucks. I would say go for that shit because the re the virgin reissues are really hot. They're not awful, but they're pretty hot, and you're not getting them for a bargain in the states. Clearly. Not a shock there either. Killing Joke never did shit in the States. Honestly, the first album on import on the back of punk being a thing is probably the, the, the only one that was well known. Certainly, what's this is what's this for had no distribution over here. Because I, I, I had um, this is a band Peter Prescott from Mission to Burma turned me on to. I'd never heard of them um, in the late 80s when I was starting to learn about cool music. And like I was coming into the store and like, I love Camper Van Beethoven. Tell me what good music is. And like, you know, he's just like, fucking okay, this kid. But he was like, you, you should check out Killing Joke's first album. And I was just like, like, it was fucking life-changing. But he, would t he told me, he's like, you can't get any of the other records. They never got distributed over here. And then this EG record label was a total void in terms of American distribution as well. Despite the fact that, um, e uh, whatchamacallit, they legit were getting played on college radio in 85. Because this is when Goth and The Cure and everything starts to blow up. Killing Joke benefited from that. 80s was a good radio hit on college radio, and so was Kings and Queens. That's where I, I first heard Kings and Queens on the radio, on a college radio show, and, you know, tried to find that album. Um, but yeah, you know, this came out when I was a, when I was a freshman, no, sophomore or something in college, and uh, 
Yeah, this was like, I mean, all the mall goth people that were into wax tracks and they had the black box and all that shit. Yeah, this record was a, like, th this was a drink coaster for goth kids in the mid 90s, pre, like, kids that were real goths that weren't into Marilyn Manson, that were like, you know, listened to Bauhaus and were like studied into goth in the 80s, were hanging on to that into the 90s. Killing Jokes Pandemonium was was definitely. Yes, and it has holy geometry, right? Yeah, then Jazz's mysticism is legendary um, and a big part of, of Killing Joke and always has been. I mean, it, it's like, you know, it really got stupid starting here. This uh, bizarre uh, one-off Jordy thing with Jordy. Jazz, I don't know, man. What a fucking character. I mean, just, you gotta have, you gotta, you gotta tip your cap. And he's so bitter, too. I love how bitter he is about everything that's ever happened to Killing Joke, because why not? Um, <laughs> yeah, this DVD... I mean, that, yeah, there you go. <laughs> this DVD performance of, a, I think it's of a reunion show um, in 03. Yeah. You know, and of course it ends with Pandemonium. I mean, that became a signature song of theirs off of, of, um, of, uh, of that album. So uh, funnily, Jaina's not on there. I don't know why, because Jaina was, I mean, Jaina's like a My Bloody Valentine song with a, with a goth crooner over it. It's really good. Um yeah, Sam G, this is a really good call out. People th people who are throwing away old computer games, those are CD cases. Like, just get that shit. If you're going to start collecting CDs, you're going to get broken cases. You're going to get, like, people advertising discounts that are just the artwork in it, plastic slip. And they're doing that so they have enough room to store all this stuff and because they can't have... The factorial, you know, square footage of plastic CDs really does add up. Fucking trust me, you should see my basement I'm in. So, you know, stores that are trying to save space will often just chuck the jewel case and put everything in little plastic slips. If you have the case, who gives a shit and they're selling it to you for a discount? It's something to look out for. You find stores that run that way, you can really get some outsized deals because they're, you know, they're trying to do right by the consumer or whatever and entice the consumer by acknowledging like you're not getting the full product. It's, it's a good take. Um, man, I, I spent a lot of time on Nitsurab. My life with the Thrill Kill Cult, you know, uh, want to give some, uh, some shout outs to some Boston, Boston brethren. Um, so Buzz McCoy moved out to Chicago and hooked up a groovy man. And this record is absolutely signature. Like this is OG wax tracks, like as much as anything with Al and, you know, he's obviously around it anyway. Um, I, the bomb gang girls, like everything about this is is really good shit you're not gonna i mean you probably can find a cd reissue of this for not that bad this is not a band you're you're gonna find cheap because of the cult tax like you know this record i've seen this album for sale for over a hundred dollars the original vinyl um and i'm sure there are people on discogs 50 pounds uh yeah here's like here's what like a price tag scrape 50 bucks on lp um it's iconic and for a lot of people this is one where you you actually would want the vinyl um to have that it, it was a it was a very very crucial like massive goth industrial crossover record into techno really i mean this is very loopy um you know it's very loopy and it has real flavors of having heard late 80s kind of very dawn of post acid techno um and it's got lots of sampling you know, that's one of the key things. Like, I'm a big sucker for the sampling bands. Um, but the sampling bands have their own problem, which is nobody gave a shit about the legal aspect of the sampling back then. And that's all different now. So some of these reissues, um, I don't think uh, Kill Cult got tagged on this and had to re-edit. But there have been cases of bands that had to literally re-edit tapes, re-edit mixes and masters to pull out things they couldn't clear, uh, which really sucks from a historical accuracy perspective. But... Confessions of a Knife uh, is, is a pretty monster record. This is, uh, for me, you know, I mean, basically this is the run, right? They, they got Confessions, Sexplosion, and 13 Above. These are like the three core records. Basically, everybody's like, they got a major label deal. They left Wax Tracks and tried to make it, you know, screw them. You know, 13's still okay. But, you know, after that, they just, they become so self-parodic. And it's just like, oh, boobs. Like, I just, I don't know. Like, <laughs> everything about them just kind of, for me, sucks after the initial run. They kind of, you know, it's, look, it's sort of similar to Lords of Acid in that way. You know, they, they, they're also incredibly famous for this. Voodoo You is one of the most iconic, you know, out there, you know, crazy, sexual, you know, electronic, dark music. Oh, my God. 
Um, but you know, Lust was a massive hit out of the gate. I said on Acid is like a fucking legendary uh, crossover, like dirge, acid, industrial fucking masterpiece. Um, the opening is a little bit hot, <laughs> but you know, this, I, these guys were really, really good for a lot longer than they get credit for. Certainly way better for longer than throw kill cult in my view. Um, you know, did they become a stupid sort of crazy Disneyland circus live? Yeah, of course they did. Um, did I, was I like interested in that? Not particularly. I mean, listen, I, 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 I'm not like a, a like a dress up hair dye. Let's all go you know, crazy, what I, you know, it's just a vibe, whatever, it's fine, but it's a, it's a, it's a gothy, you know, vibe that I just don't go for, um, but the, the, you know, despite that being present in the same way that it later becomes sort of with cult, thrill, cult, cult, it's so out of the gate and in your face and part of what, uh, Lords of Acid were, yet the music is pretty solid, um, you know, there are even people who like that comeback Deep Chills record and thought it wasn't too bad, um, you know, but yeah, I mean, look, this is what you're dealing with here. This is, this is kind of like their whole thing. It's like all, you know, bondage and, and like, we're out with kink and sex and all that shit. Yay. Wow. That's shocking. Uh, but whatever, um, certainly through 90, you know, 94 and the singles, you know, also the B sides are kind of cool experiments. These guys were really like their own thing and they were doing it in a way that was pretty strong. Um, but, you know, when I talk about this and I talk about the edge of, of Big Beat and stuff, you know, Meat Beat Manifesto is the band and Satyricon is the album. I mean, 99%, the early stuff is more industrial and then they really become the progenitors and pioneers of what we think of in terms of classic Big Beat, like sampled, cra like, sorry, sampled, crushed, you know, compressed, bit crushed drum loops and, you know, that kind of like hooligan, you know, lazy walk, talk over the track shit. Satyricon is an all time fucking classic. Edge of No Control, Original Control, like everything circles, like this whole fucking thing shreds. Um, and you can get it for nothing. And like, this is, this is like dollar for dollar. Meat Beat up through, um, up through here. And there's a reissue of Armed Audio Warfare I mentioned when I came across it in another stream you, you can find that anywhere if you go down it's got a gun on the cover this thing so the mute reissue in 94 this album never got released and it was cobbled together from other shit it's all from 88 you know and it's around that that period of like you know these other two bands i'm not gonna have time to get to frontline assembly and front 242 um you know like early and mid 80s uh canadian and belgian acts that were so incredibly important um, Meat Beat kind of builds off that and they were, you know, they had reach into, um, you know, Orbital and other acts at that time that were coming up in the very early nineties, but like all of these have been reissued and are really easy to find. And, you know, there are people who go in for actual sounds of voice, like th this, the late period I, I wasn't big on subliminal. Yeah. See, a lot of people do like actual sounds and voice that I get it. Um, I, and there are people who also love Are You Okay? I mean, look, there's people who basically think In Dub is the best album they ever did. I, you know, fine. Um, you go with what you go for. I, for me, it's the it's the fact that, like, Satyricon was, like, it's similar to Killing Joke's Pandemonium. Everybody in college had this record and was blasting it. You know, consolidated the Yeasty Girls, You Suck, all these big beat, like, early big beat things. Um, and, and it was just, like, it was this sound and you couldn't get enough of it. You literally couldn't get enough of it because there weren't that there were no bands doing it. There were only like four or five records that sounded like it that were using that big drum, you know, backbeat style of sampling versus drum machine. It was a new idea in this, you know, sort of electronic and dance pop genre. And, you know, it's it's exemplified. I mean, look, Millie Vanilli essentially are doing beat sampling. They're doing funky drummer electronic when Bernard Sumner breaks up New Order with Johnny Marr. They did it. Um, you know, Depeche eventually sort of does it. Um, but Meat Beat just is, is, the, is the band. I mean, when you think about the success of the Chemical Brothers and the bands and, you know, shit like Death in Vegas that comes in Crystal fucking Method um, that comes on the back of what these guys fucking did, um, you got to owe it. You know, the fact that you can get their, the, the peak initial run of their great shit. And, and even if you don't like all of it, live through their evolution up into the, the absolute crescendo of Satyricon for like eight bucks. Get on that. I mean, absolutely just such a crucial fucking band. 
Um, and again, you know, for, for, for me, like I'm a, this is the, this is the kind of music I like. I already talked at the beginning, like industrial, goth, experimental, there's all different ways to, you know, rotate and approach these genres. Everyone has their own sort of thing they like. Me, as a drummer, I'm a big beat guy. And so that's why Nitsa Reb is one of my favorites and Ministry is one of my favorites, you know? You, that's sort of the thread for me is the beat. And it's even why I like Lords of Acid's early stuff because the beats are like mega fucking slamming kick drums, like really chubby, heavy shit. Uh, yeah, an FSO oil sample for, for Papua, New, Papua New Guinea for radio, yeah, no doubt. I mean, the, you know, these guys were... These guys were doing shit that that others weren't. Right out of the, the gate, though, like God O.D. was a substantial, you know, disgust hit, um, and uh, and they had a lot. They just they had a lot going on, a lot on the ball, and uh, wanted to call them out for sure. So you know, these four all the way up, um, just really solid shit. And, you know, this for me is where I lose it. Like albums way too long, way too many ideas, kind of trying too hard. Um, it's just too much. Like, I think they just, they drowned in their own kind of shit at that time. And, and yeah, like I say, a lot of people feel like they really got it back on actual sounds and voices and even kept it through. Are you okay? You know, it's a band you can go, you can find their stuff anywhere. I mean, basically any of these records for $2 or you know, anything under five, uh, you know, you're not going to go wrong by exploring it, um, learning about it and, 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 you know, figuring out whether it's for you. And that's sort of the, you know, Obviously, you can go on streaming and check them out, you know, before you make that call. Um, but, you know, if you're, if you're running down a store or somebody who has a bunch of it all at once, just get it. Um, all right, so that's going to do it for today. But, yeah, it's fun. I kind of, I kind of I drowned on a couple. Uh, art. I didn't expect that to happen. But, you know, thanks for coming through, hanging out. And uh, we'll do it again Thursdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, as you see. Sunday is 2 p.m. Eastern. I finally did a Sunday stream, even though it's New Year's Day. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not doing anything, so no problem. I appreciate people who showed up too. Um, you know, I might have had stuff going on. Um, solid showing. So thanks again. See you Thursday night. Um, and yeah, we'll figure out what, what we're going to chat about in the week. All right. Bye.